All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, like Vanessa said, my name is Jeremy Hamlin. I'm a supervisor in our contract and grant accounting office. Uh, I'm going to be presenting today alongside uh, Rebecca Valdez. She's an accountant three in our office. And then also uh, Jessica Alderete. She's the other supervisor in our office. Um, so uh, the three of us are going to kind of take turns presenting the material today. As we go through this presentation, um, if you have any questions, uh, we just ask that you wait till the end of our presentation so we can get through the material in, in our allotted time. If you come across a question that's specific for an award you might have, um, we ask that maybe you contact your fiscal monitor in our office, or you can contact our office and we can route your question to the appropriate person. So, um, so as Christine kind of touched on uh, with the office of OSP, they basically handle the pre-award aspect of your award. Once your award gets accepted, that's when our office steps in and we kind of handle the post-award aspect um, of that award. So we're just going to give you a little overview of our, uh, of our office. Um, contract and Ground Accounting's objective is to provide support to the PI and the campus departments who administer the sponsored projects. Once an award has been made, we manage it from beginning to end. That is to say, we set up that contract or grant in our financial system. We monitor the expenses as they occur, and we close the award when it's ended. Uh, our office is responsible for submitting all required uh, financial reports to the funding agencies. Uh, we handle both billing the agencies as well as collecting the revenue. Uh, additionally, one of the main responsibilities of our office is to respond to annual audit requests. Compliance is what drives these audits, and therefore our office is responsible for ensuring that all your expenses charged to the awards comply with federal, state, as well as UNM policies. Um, recently, the federal government finalized a large project in which they combined eight federal circulars into one uniform guidance. And I think they mentioned that a little bit earlier, um, the UG or uniform guidance. Um, our office is responsible for, um, to, to assure that grants and contracts adhere to this new uniform guidance and any specific terms or conditions to your award. All right, uh, once the award package is re received from OSP, um, we set up the information in Banner, which is our financial system. Uh, it's a web-based financial system, uh, campus-wide. The financial reports and billings we submit to the various agencies are based in Banner. After we set up the index for your award, we will notify you via, via email of the index number so you can begin your spending. We also send you a signature authorization form. This form identifies who has signature authority on your award and provides us with overexpenditure indexes, uh, which will be used in any event of overexpenditure on the award. The signature authorization form is required, and we reference this form when reviewing and approving any financial transactions. Um, talk a little bit about uh, requests for approval to spend funds, what we call an RTS, RTSF. Um, so in some cases, an in index may be needed uh, prior to the award notification. If you have reasonable assurance that you are receiving a new award and you have approvals from your college, you can complete this RTSF form, the request for approval to spend funds. Um, with this completed form, we are able to set up and request an index, and this will allow you to correctly charge expenses and avoid any cost transfers. All right, now we're gonna talk a little bit about audits. Um, as I mentioned previously, one of the uh, main responsibilities of our office is to respond to any um, annual audit requests. Um, the Office of Management and Budget, referred to as OMB, under the uniform guidance, requires an uh, annual independent single audit to be, be performed by an external audit firm. Um, I think it's important to note here that these external auditors are required to be independent to the university, and therefore they have no loyalties to us. Uh, they're here to do their job and make sure that we're doing our job. 
Um, the external audit firm that handles the audit for UNM uh, is currently the national firm of KPMG, so we kind of handle and facilitate that process. In addition to the annual external audit, internal audits are conducted by our internal audit office as needed, and I believe they'll be presenting a little bit later on today. Um, as well, sponsoring agencies such as the NIH National Institute of Health, NSF National Science Foundation, some of these agencies will audit on a regular basis as needed. Um, they also do site reviews and desk audits periodically, so we're kind of there to, to facilitate that process and make sure everything goes smoothly. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the annual independent single audit that we go through. Um, it's probably the most important audit uh, that we go through each year because it's an audit of the federal dollars that are spent. Um, the auditors will select specific transactions by which they evaluate our internal controls to make sure we are following uh, all applicable UNM policies and procedures. Um, we want to mention that during the course of these audits, uh, external auditors may ask PIs to fill out extensive questionnaires on internal controls and policies and procedures, so just be aware that that's out there. Um, if you get a request, it's kind of in their normal routine of things. They want to find out what kind of internal controls are in place and um, to make sure you're kind of adhering to those policies and procedures as well. Um, they're also going to be looking at effort reporting policies and process as well as reviewing transactions for allowability and transaction, transactions that are incurred after the award budget end date. Um, and our office handles the uh, effort reporting certification process so we can also help you facilitate that as well. Um, but it's just important to note, I, I think our job here is to protect you as the PI and protect the university as a whole. So. We're here to uh, kind of work together with you to make sure everything goes smoothly. Uh, if you're ever contacted by an agency regarding a pending audit, please let us know by contacting your fiscal monitor. That's probably the best way to go about it. We should be the only ones to, to be responding to any financial requests. Um, under the new uniform guidance, there's been a big emphasis that's been placed on subrecipient monitoring. It's kind of been... Um, a hot topic lately. Um, so with this, there's increased responsibility to UNM as the pass-through entity of these federal awards to uh, subrecipients. There's kind of an, an increased emphasis on some of those um, compliance aspects. So these new responsibilities include new risk assessment requirements that we're um, required to do, uh, enhanced monitoring and performance metrics, uh, we also have to evaluate each subrecipient's risk of noncompliance to determine the appropriate level of monitoring for those subrecipients. And these risk factors include such things as uh, subrecipients' past experience with particular programs, uh, results of previous audits, change in key personnel, or a substantial change in internal control systems, um, and examples like a major software change or, or something like that. And then they're, they're also going to be looking at results of federal monitoring. Um, if appropriate, we must consider imposing more conditions to the subaward, such as no advance payments, uh, withholding funds until there is evidence of acceptable performance, increased monitoring or more detailed reporting, and additional prior approvals. And that's in the case where you have a more risky subrecipient. Um, those are some of the um, increased conditions that we can place on those subrecipients. Uh, it's important to note again the, the responsibilities to the PI to ensure the programmatic aspects of your grant are met prior to approving your invoices. Um, in addition, subaward invoice payments uh, must now be made within 30 days. That's probably one of the more important things that's come out in the new uniform guidance. So. There's a 30-day um, requirement on these subaward invoice payments. Uh, we'll touch a little more on compliance. Um, compliance testing is what drives these audits. Therefore, our office is responsible for ensuring that all expenses charged to the awards comply with federal, state, sponsor, as well as UNM policies. It ensures that sponsors are charged fairly it verifies responsible use of taxpayer money. 
The risks involved are a potential loss of federal or state funding, damage to your repu reputation as well as UNM's reputation, um, possible fines and penalties for noncompliance, and um, audit findings are reported to the federal government and become public records. So that's why these um, single audits that happen annually are so important. Those findings are public record and the federal government is made aware of it. Um, also, there's potential for UNM to lose expanded authority. And, and basically what this is, so there's several federal agencies that have waived cost-related prior approvals and permit certain institutions such as UNM to decide budget changes under their expanded authority, which are automatically in place for most grants. Um, Pre-award spending, no cost extensions, and carryover of unobligated balances to subsequent funding periods are just a few of these um, pre-approvals that are granted. <clears throat> so now we're going to um, delve into some of the uniform guidance um, factors affecting allowability of costs. Um, having a proposal awarded is a great accomplishment. So UNM is a large research university and contract and grant accounting supports this research function. So we applaud any new research funding that happens. That's why we're here to help you avoid any problems relating to making any expenditures of your award. Um, in addition to following university policy in the sp specific language that's set out in your award, we refer to OMB uniform guidance um, and particularly with costs and Costs must meet the following general criteria in order to be what we considered allowable under these federal guidelines. Um, they've got to be necessary and reasonable for the performance of the federal award, and they have to be allocable under these principles. They have to conform to any limitations or exclusions set forth in these principles or in your federal award as to types or amount of cost items. Uh, they've got to be consistent with policies and procedures that apply uniformly to both federally financed and other activities um, of the non-federal entity. They have to be accorded consistent treatment. Um, a cost may not be assigned to a federal award as a direct cost if any other cost incurred for the same purpose in similar circumstances has been allocated to the federal award as an indirect cost. Um, they have to be determined in accordance with GAAP, um, that stands for Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, except for state and local governments and Indian tribes only, as otherwise provided for in, in the cost principles. Uh, they cannot be included as a cost or used to meet cost sharing or matching requirements of any other federally financed program in either the current period or prior period, and they have to be adequately documented. Um, along with us, you will also need to know the rules because if following an audit the agency disallows costs, you are responsible for any of those disallowances. So that's why this is such an important topic. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Rebecca and she'll go over some currently unallowable costs. So uh, here are some uh, currently unallowable costs. Uh, keep in mind that uh, most things are allowable, but it's much easier just to go over the things that are not, un uh, that are not allowable. Uh, expenditures for uh, general purpose equipment such as desks and paper. General purpose equipment that cannot specifically be allocated to a project is unallowable. By com uh, but computing devices uh, under 5,000 uh, may be a direct charge if the machine is very essential to that project and, uh, and no other equipment can actually achieve the same purpose. Um, there's also uh, extravagant and convenient purchases that are not allowable, personal living expenses as well as entertainment costs, uh, donations, memberships, and lobbying, um, as well as alcohol beverages. Um, one item uh, that used to be on this list that was unallowable was administrative salaries. Under the old circular A120, uh, A21, the specific project um, must be large and complex, had to be remote, uh, remotely outside, or involved extensive data analysis in order to be charged to the award. 
Uh, now under the new uniform guidance, administrative salaries must be integral to a project. Individuals involved can be uh, specifically identified. Uh, the costs have been included in the proposed budget. Um, and the federal agency has given written approval uh, prior to uh, written approval in order to charge this award. So just on, on that aspect of it, if, if that is your intent, it is, it is very wise and to propose it at the beginning and get that written approval. Because this is one of the uniform guidance that's just come into, into play. So it's just really nice to have all those prepared so you don't run into any uh, delays in your proposal. Um, if you are unsure of any, um, any specific uh, charges that should be on a sponsored project, contact your fiscal monitor and they can direct you on, on, on which would be appropriate or not. There's a pop quiz. Did you guys think you were going to get away with that <laughs> pop quiz? <laughs> so uh, here's a, a question here. And let's see, hopefully it tests you guys what, what we've said so far. Which of the following satisfy the three basic cost principles? A, uh, principal rented, uh, a PI uh, rented a car because her family joined uh, her on a conference trip and needed the vehicle to get around during the day. B, the PI paid $25 for a shuttle services from the airport to the hotel because there is, uh, that's where the conference is being held. C, the PI took a taxi to dinner because he wanted to meet a friend at a restaurant outside walking distance of the hotel. There was, however, a restaurant in the hotel and there was other restaurants in walking distance. <coughs> Which ones do you guys feel? B. B. B is the correct answer. <laughs> B is the correct answer. Um, a and C do meet the criteria of reasonableness as, as, um, as they are not a convenient uh, purchase. So basically, they, they don't meet that. For that reason, that's why they don't meet that criteria. Okay, graduate students have been working tirelessly to meet a deadline. Would it be allowable for a PI to buy a gift cards to reward the stressed out students for meeting the deadline? Yes, no, or C, would it be uh, approval from a contracting C. officer? Who, who said C? B. You said C. <laughs> well, let me, let me uh, elaborate on that. So. A, although the expense is allocable, uh, you know the students have been working on the project, gift cards would not be allowable or reasonable. So that's why it excludes A. Uh, C, the contracting officer who binds us to uh, our legal doc document is the only person authorized to, uh, to uh, make changes to an executed award on behalf of the agency. So the contracting officer differs from the program officer. The program officer is more interested in doing the science, as well as the contracting officer is the only person that can actually allow changes um, to the funding portion of the award. But in this case, we will say B, it is not allowable. But then again, you can also contact your contracting <laughs> officer if you choose to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If samples are being collected in Alaska and additional preservation materials are needed, which of the following uh, would be allowable? A is four bottles of moonshine, one bottle of uh, formaldehyde, C is rubbing alcohol, and, or D, all the above? D, because you're in Alaska. <laughs> so D, in this case, the assumption is that traditional preservation methods were not available at the time. And the stand, uh, standard thought would be, is this beneficial to the award? Therefore, the corn squeezing and rubbing alcohol uh, could, uh, could be considered a reasonable substitute under the circumstances, this is depending on where you're at and what means you guys need to do to, you know, to, uh, to protect your material and, and uh, and, uh, Even though yeah. moonshine is, by a definition, illegal and controlled substance. True, and it's one of the unallowable items, but in certain circumstances it would be allowable in this particular case, in order to preserve your material to do so. <laughs> Some common... Uh, audit targets here. Um, 
Here are some cost, uh, cost transfers in and out of restricted indexes, accelerated spending at the uh, end of the budget period, uh, effort, uh, proposed, uh, effort proposed is not compliant with actual efforts, expenditures posted to miscellaneous expenses uh, is one items that, uh, that are looked at very carefully. Um, most recently, we, um, I looked up a, an audit that was done by the HHS office, which is the actual agency on a very well-known university, and I won't name them because I just won't. I just don't want to go ahead and pay anything. So in this particular case, they were audited, and they found that the PI failed to provide a 25% level of effort proposed on the subaward application and the PI did not submit effort reports to two of his lab technicians, and, and some effort reports were not confirmed. Uh, aud auditors also reviewed documentation of support for salary cost transfers and reviewed emails stating that, uh, that transfers were necessary to spend down the award. <laughs> okay, so in some cases it was because the grant uh, award was uh, approved late, which is a common occurrence. He goes, but the documentation was missing and that was required by the university owned procedures and um, to verify that the transfer charges were appropriate to the grant. But in other cases, funds uh, were transferred to spend down the award, which is not allowed. Um, another footnote too is that they found out the initial email that was provided to the auditors had been altered and stuff so, so and to omit the explanation as to exactly why the transfer had to happen. All right, clarification. Sure. In terms of uh, once you get into a project that's rolling and you realize that you overlooked a particular uh, a demand for time and effort by somebody who was not included in the first uh, uh, budget, can you, we do have the option of going in there and saying, we need to make this change. Uh, what are the steps that need to be followed, correct? Yes, uh, the, there is. So here on the next slide, cost transfers in and out of restricted indexes. I think he might be talking about budget revision. Oh, a budget, budget revision, revision in yes. itself. Well, budget revisions, depending on, uh, on, on the left, uh, time left on the award, sometimes agencies will allow a budget revision at the end of the award. It all depends on whether those stipulations are either required or we can actually have the expended authority to do so. It is, uh, yeah, we look at all those case by case basis depending on what, what it is that you, that you uh, need to get prior approval for. On an effort portion of it, if it's within that budget period of time, I would, I would actually uh, allow it on the award and then communicate with the agency and let them know that this is what happened. I said, okay, you know, especially if we submitted the final FFR during that time, things can always be changed and actually amended as long as we have enough time, I guess, to go ahead and contact the agency and ask for that approval. I think it's the communication against right. ourselves and the agencies it Should will work. we go through UNM first as opposed to, say, like uh, dealing with a federal agency? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Contact us right away. As soon as you find that something is actually uh, missing or that you did not allocate something that should be, contact us right away and then we'll do that uh, contacting for you with the agency. Yeah. Okay. Um, here in the uh, in and out uh, uh, for restricted indexes for cost transfers, if uh, over 90 days or, uh, after original transaction, CNG accounting requires a memo stating adequate justification. Transfers out may g give the appearance of moving deficits from one federal project to another. And transfers in give the uh, appearance that you're spending down the <coughs> award. Excessive number of cost transfers indicate poor oversight. Cost transfers uh, near the end of the award may draw some audit scrutinies and potential disallowance. So it, it's, it's um, once you figure it out that there is uh, an appropriate charge that, that is identified on your award, co uh, cost transfer should be processed immediately. 
Uh, this lessens the need for the 90-day uh, memo, but if you need the 90-day memo, we definitely uh, need to, to get that uh, ahead of time. And also, uh, carefully written documentation is the key to successfully defending um, uh, these um, transfers in an audit. Um, agency approval is required. So uh, even though we have the expended authority under federal awards, however, there are certain um, charges that require prior approval. Uh, Non-federal agencies may require prior, prior approval as well for different items. Um, request for additional funding and extension of time is one of them. Change in the scope and project objective. Change in the key personnel uh, named in the award. Uh, PI absence for more than three months or 25% reduction of their PI effort. Uh, substantial budget revisions, <coughs> extra compensation payments, and foreign and domestic travel, on, especially on DOE awards, uh, Sandia National Labs, as well as Los Alamos National Labs and Brookhaven. Um, my suggestion is to become uh, very familiar with your award language and agency guidelines. And that way you guys can be familiar and actually be on top of these things. Especially the one where it's the PI as absence more than three months. Um, some of them take sabbatical and stuff and don't realize it's gonna be more than three months. They do need to notify their agencies, especially if they are requesting that in their terms and conditions. It could be just plain notify, uh, notifying them if there's no effort change. But notifying them is what we do definitely need to do. Uh, I will now turn it over to Jessica. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm gonna kind of run through my stuff a little bit quickly because we're kind of running out of time. So if you have <coughs> questions, just feel free to ask us after or you can even just send us an email and we'll answer questions then. But um, basically, my part that I'm gonna first go over first is the effort certification process. Effort is a time spent on sponsored projects that is expressed as a percentage of the total um, employees total university related duties and is a mechanism to confirm salaries charged to a sponsored project are accurate relative to the work committed to the proposal effort must equal cumulative total of a hundred percent but not exceed a hundred percent if working on multiple projects effort reporting at UNM is done on a semi-annual basis, which begins every January and July. Um, UNM uses a web-based system called um, for, for effort certification module to complete this process, which can be accessed through Lobo Web, which you see up here on the screen. Um, there are two stages to the effort certification process. Stage one is to pre-review the effort and is completed by the account administrator. Stage two is to is to certify the effort and is completed by the program investigator. Employees who are required to turn in timesheets are not required to um, are not required to have their time certified, and those people are listed as two R's in banner. Um, employees who are paid monthly, which are listed as five R's in banner, are the ones who get certified on restricted indexes. Once your sponsor project has ended, the award is closed in Banner using an automated workflow process. The system sends a notification to the PI and the account administrator 90 days prior to the budget period end date. In order to meet federal requirements, the closeout process must be completed within 90 days of the budget period end date. In some cases, the agencies will require submission of additional reports during this process. One of the common issues that we run through during this time is that the, at the time of the work closeout is the fact that some awards have not been spent evenly throughout the project. So it's good practice to have an expenditure plan and don't wait until the end of the award to spend funds. The problem with having ex excessive expenditures at the end of the award raises questions with auditors, especially when equipment is purchased during that time frame. Document retention for sponsored awards begins at the end of the project end date, which is different than the new, normal UNM policies. So timesheets referring to a restricted index must re be retained anywhere from three to seven years after the award has closed, depending on the agency requirements. 
Now I'm going to go over how to review monthly expenditures. It's good practice to review and reconcile expenditures that hit your award on a monthly basis, and there are a few reports that can help you complete that process. There are three different ways to determine your index and fund balance and to see the detailed activity on your award. One of the um, systems you can use is Banner, and the Banner screen that we use is Frigided, which gives you an inception to date information on your budget and actual expenditures and available balances. It can also give you information for a particular period by selecting specific dates. Another um, system that you can use is My Reports. And you can run a contract and grant general ledger detail summary for your index, or you can run a salary labor redistribution report um, for an index or for an individual. Lastly, you can also use South Service, which is also called Global Web, in my UNM to see each employee's payroll detail. And finally, this slide contains additional information for um, tools, training, and resources, which we also have listed in your packet that we gave to you for different links. Um, we strongly recommend that you join um, the round <coughs> listserv and attend those meetings because there's very there's helpful information during those meetings. They, the meetings consist of, of updates, changes, new topics that affect research um, administration community. We also have a link that has um, our contracts and grant website, which on our website we talk about the startup and the closeout process and also effort certification process. So if you're having problems approving your efforts, we have a bunch of quick links out there that kind of walk you through the process. Also, the other three um, websites that some of the other people have mentioned is the OVPR office, um, UNM policy, and the uniform guidance. Also, if um, we recommend that you, if you have problems or anything else, to log into MyUNM and you can access um, EOD classes for contract and grants training and EOD training on there as well. But this completes our section of the training. Um, we thank you for your time. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, purchasing, I believe, is up next. I think Amy Ortiz is going to be up here to present. Thank you.